Over seven years ago, Infinite Warfare Zombies was officially released, and the first map, Zombies in Spaceland, was an excellent introduction to Infinity Ward's take on the Zombies mode, following their experiences with Ghost's Extinction. While rough around the edges, the map left me wanting more, although over time, I found the usual experiences frustrating and convoluted. Many years later, I would make a video exploring said remaining DLC, and expressing my many criticisms and issues with the mode. But over time, I found myself replaying the game, whether it be for videos, live streams, or even just playing with friends, and it got me thinking. Were my initial criticisms too harsh? While I agree with the points I made, I don't agree with how I said them. Barring the fact the production is rushed, sloppy, and overall, one I would like to give a new coat of paint. With all that said, hello there fellow zombie slayers, my name is Stanley557, sit back and relax as we take the next couple of weeks to re-explore IW Zombies. Is it as bad as I said it was? Is it as good as others claim it to be? And when will I ever make an Extinction Retrospective? Well, let's answer these questions, and more, in my complete re-review of Infinite Warfare Zombies, a game I still really wanted to like. In a modern spin given to every review at this point, let's go over what Infinite Warfare does to set itself apart from other zombie outings. One of the game's most impactful changes is its scavenge system. Prior to the release of Cold War, Infinite Warfare zombies experimented with an equipment scavenge system. Whenever specific zombies are killed wearing a tote bag or a fanny pack, they may drop an item obtainable by any of the nearby players. These items can span from a wide array of equipment, like map-specific items like Spaceland's tickets and coin systems, an additional ammo clip, or even the coveted money drop, which can gift players between 50 to even a thousand supplementary points. This system consistently affects gameplay, and rewards players handsomely for keeping a keen eye on the undead, but dooms items like gas grenades to a vicious cycle of RNG. Although, due to the consistently high drop rate, you're bound to get your desired item eventually. Similar to Black Ops 3's Gobblegum system, Infinite Warfare Zombies sports fate and fortune cards, an in-game consumable that grants players unique buffs and power-ups. Unlike Black Ops 3, however, players are given access to each of their five cards from the get-go. Players can choose to refill their cards at any time as a designated Fate and Fortune card machine for 3,000 points up to five times per game. Personally, I never found a desire to refill my cards, much less actually use them. The system doesn't feel as versatile in gameplay as Black Ops 3's Gobblegums or Black Ops 4's Elixirs, it really feels like you get about one use out of each card. You know where you want to use them, and you know how you're going to use them. But besides that, they don't serve much purpose outside of their one use. But who knows, that might just be me. Another amazing change is the character selection. After beating a map's respective easter egg, players are granted the ability to enter in a code on the menu using the D-pad to play as a map-specific celebrity character. Options include David Hasselhoff on Spaceland, Kevin Smith on Raven the Redwoods, Pam Greer on Shaolin Shuffle, Elvira, Mistress of the Night on Attack of the Radioactive Thing, and the game's antagonist, Willard Wyler, played by Paul Rubens as the game's final reward in Zombies in Spaceland in Director's Cut mode. It's genuinely such a unique reward, and each of these characters are given specific quotes, audio cues, animations, and interactions. For example, playing as Willard Wyler on Zombies in Spaceland grants players an all-new announcer, melee weapon, and unique outro cutscene which is a really cool addition to an already amazing map, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Another gameplay-focused decision is the map's Afterlife Arcade. Going down and bleeding out in a co-op game of Infinite Warfare takes players to the Afterlife Arcade, a space between realms that allows players to participate in arcade games for a chance to rejoin their teammates mid-round. This system was implemented to give players something to do while waiting for the round to end, while also rewarding said players with a second chance if they so desire. This is honestly a really cool idea on paper, and so far IW is the only game in the series to attempt to keep players engaged after bleeding out, besides gobblegums like Impatient and Black Ops 3. Returning to the map gives players an opportunity to repurchase their loadout for 2,000 points, if they're able to return to the map's weapon cache before time runs out. 
I personally enjoy this compromise more than simply returning players to the map, which has a starting pistol, or like in Cold War, you get points equivalent to what you actually had in your loadout. It gives players a second chance to pick themselves back up. Although 2000 points for, at times, double pack of punched weapons is a bit too low of a price point. And like Cold War's Tombstone Cash originally, players should be offering up whatever points they currently have to reattain their equipment. Whether that be 200 or 20,000. But I guess that would punish a late game down, so maybe they had the right compromise after all. A criticism I have with this feature comes in solo play. Instead of simply allowing players to go down and lose their perks, IW forces solo players to enter the Afterlife Arcade upon downing, and returning to the map to reacquire their equipment. Granting players more of an opportunity to lose the game while they attempt to reach the weapon cache. The system is rather redundant in solo play, and punishes players the most in maps like Beast from Beyond, where players can spawn in a completely separate arena of the map. Why a player can't just pick themselves back up after going down is beyond me. This feature works perfectly fine in the map's Mephistopheles boss fight. So why it wasn't implemented in solo blows my mind. The game sends you to the Afterlife Arcade just to immediately let you leave. It makes you wonder why they didn't cut out the middleman in solo. Then there's each map's bank system. A simple little idea that allows all players to deposit money in a singular bank account, allowing any teammate to come up and take out what has been donated. I really like this feature much more than its implementation in BO2. It incentivizes teamwork and cooperation for struggling teammates, a feature many of the modern entries have been lacking. And unlike Black Ops 2, players can't stockpile an insane amount of points and destroy a map's pacing and flow. But hey, that's what Director's Cut is for, I suppose. Another amazing change is the ability to remove a perk at any time. Here it is, the feature that would fix many of the problems that have plagued Treyarch's systems for years with their perk setups. Being able to remove a perk at will allows players to change their setup on the fly, if they have the cash to pay for it. This is such an amazing gameplay decision, and encourages setup creativity and flexibility, much more than a feature like Secret Sauce in Black Ops 4 might ever allow. Oh, how could I forget about the weapon variant system? Carrying over a feature introduced in multiplayer and implemented into zombies, the Armory allows players to apply unique custom variants to all of the game's weapons. These variants provide small in-game buffs, attachments, stats, and special abilities at the highest rarities. These special abilities vary wildly, taking guns like the Type 2 and turning them into powerful akimbo shotguns, the EBR Bolt Action Sniper Rifle, and turning it into a charged burst rifle that fires all 30 of its deadly shots in seconds, and turns LMGs like the Mauler into a fast-firing, high-mobility LMG that can fire upwards of 5 bullets into enemies when properly aimed on sights. This system can drastically change the difficulty of combat, but requires players to invest time into weekly challenges to earn enough salvage to unlock these variants, giving players a good reward for grinding but a grinding process that can take weeks at a time. Or you could just buy supply drops. Now that's a supply drop. Another powerful inclusion is the game's double pack-a-punch feature. In a first for the series, players can pack-a-punch their weapons a second time. If you ignore exos. This second pack-a-punch level can be unlocked through a small side quest on most every map, except for Spaceland, where the main quest is required. And finally, there's the game's director's cut mode which we'll talk about at the end, as it has more than enough content to justify its own section. Much like Black Ops 3, many of IW's changes seek to enhance the pre-established gameplay loop of the series, adding new features that make the experience its own, rather than taking away in an effort to branch out an experiment like Black Ops 4. Now, let's shift gears. In a first for these types of videos, let's talk about the overarching goods and bads the game manages to secure. I'm bringing up this section because while writing these scripts, I found it very difficult to introduce some of these ideas without completely sidelining the script writing. So we're gonna kind of just put them all in here. This section is being added to discuss praises and issues I have with the game that apply to every map and not just one in particular, because bad hitboxes are a game universal, and referencing it now will only allow me to talk about it better in more detail later on. Presentation. One of IW Zombie's greatest strengths is its dedication to its art style and direction. In contrast to Black Ops 3's high-intensity, sci-fi-inspired epic, Infinite Warfare goes for a more laid-back, B-movie-inspired romp that takes the audience through the many different eras of American filmmaking. The varied locales and themings is something to be admired, 
and it's easy to see why it's the first thing that jumps to players' minds whenever the game is brought up. Gameplay. Another great feature is all the little side quests and rewards players can encounter while going through the game. While the steps for some of these quest lines are absolutely atrocious, it's the thought that counts. The ones that primarily stick out to me are the various Ghosts and Skulls quest lines found on every map and the aforementioned Director's Cut. Then there's those overarching issues I had a hard time placing in the script, so let's talk about them here. One of my biggest issues with IW's gameplay is its artificial and outright unfair difficulty. This is something we'll further explore as we get into the review, but I'll briefly go over it here. Following the expansion of difficulty within the series, Call of Duty Zombies has seen more aggressive AI and various special enemy types, with minimal changes to the player's defensive profile. At this point in the series, players have been given items like the shield and consumables like gobblegums, with the latter still being optional. In Black Ops 3, enemy types begin to bear armor and ranged attacks. Special enemies include the Elemental Marguas and the Manglers, to name a few. While enemies started to sport these types of attacks, damage values were still consistent with the player's 5-hit health system. Much more dangerous attacks with high damage values are telegraphed to the player, such as the Margwa's Tentacle Slam. Infinite Warfare followed up on this formula with an increased number of ranged enemies and a tighter threshold for immunity frames whenever the undead attack you. And without a shield, the problems begin to stack up quite quickly. This hyper-aggressive playstyle causes you to go down quicker when attacked, killed from a farther range, and overall, downs can feel quite unfair compared to other experiences. Now, as I just stated, a lot of these issues can be deduced as one similarly found in Cold War in Black Ops 4. But unlike those games, Infinite Warfare doesn't offer players defensive options like the shield, armor, or specialist enhancements. So all you're left with is the 5-hit system. And considering many of the game's enemies like to deal more than 2 hits of damage, things can feel quite unfair more often than not. This doesn't mean the gameplay is awful, far from it, but as we discuss many of the game's boss fights and special enemy variety, keep these thoughts in mind. And finally, there's the game's awful hitboxes and collision detection when enemies approach the player from higher or lower elevations. This is something that can ruin training spots and overall game feel, because you'll be doing nothing wrong, but a zombie will come down from a high railing and completely block your movement. Lord forbid you slide into a zombie going from one floor to the other it can have some interesting effects. There's very little players can do to avoid this from happening, besides being mindful of their surroundings mid-round. It doesn't happen all the time, but as previously mentioned with the game's inconsistent and unfair difficulty, when it does happen, it can ruin an otherwise amazing experience. But with all of that preamble and setup talked about, let's see how all of this plays out in our first experience. The first scene is set in the 1980s. I call it Zombies in Spaceland. Hang on to your seats. Zombies in Spaceland is the first map in our Infinite Warfare Zombies adventure. Easily the game's best experience. A map filled to the brim with personality and an expansive freedom of choice, giving players the opportunity to enjoy themselves in this theme park of the damned. So, what's the story? Our adventure begins with Willard Weiler, Master of the Macabre, a famed horror director known for pushing the envelope of cinema with each successive production. Preparing to create his magnum opus, Willard handpicks four actors to star in his final production. Point Dexter Zitterman, Sally Simpson, Aaron Jordaniels, and Andre Wright. The intro cutscene swiftly introduces our heroes and Willard's enigmatic personality. One of my favorite parts about this cutscene is its overall pacing and flow. Unlike the high-stakes energy of Gorag Krovi, Voyage of Despair, and The Shadow Throne, or maps with lore-heavy introductions like Revelations and Ancient Evil. Zombies in Spaceland gives the audience a casual viewing experience ripped straight out of a Saturday morning cartoon, with slow scene transitions and corny writing. Now, my methods tend to be a little <laughs> extreme. Is he kidding? I expect my actors to give it their all. 
Their blood. Their bodies. Everything to the performance. The developers fully embraced the campy nature of the story setup. And coming off of Black Ops 3's character-driven, heartfelt narrative about the struggles four men must go through to save the universe, this is a great change of pace. Willard seats our characters in the theater to prepare them for the role of a lifetime, before subsequently pulling them into the very movie they are watching, Zombies in Spaceland. This is an extremely effective narrative device, and is one of the more genuinely creative setups we've ever seen. Performing a demonic ritual, Willard sends our heroes into the film to play out the gory deaths his movies are famous for. Once in the movie, our characters drop right into the roles thrusted upon them, seemingly too well. The animation here is some of the best the game has to offer, but sadly I couldn't find an animation studio to credit for their hard work. So whoever out there worked on these, you all did an amazing job. As mentioned last time, I love the animation on Sally when she stabs a zombie with her spoons. Her expression is properly caricatured, the dodge was stylish, and the stab was beautiful. So with the stage set, let's see how the story unfolds in Zombies in Spaceland. The Infinite Warfare zombie storyline sees us playing as one of the four characters mentioned earlier. Unlike what I said last time, I actually appreciate the idea that these characters feel and act like movie characters they're supposed to be portraying. At this point in the story, our cast is currently unaware of the danger that they are actually in. While I would prefer for the characters to ask more questions, it is pretty reasonable to assume this is all still part of the job they signed up for, despite how crazy it may seem. Point Dexter of all people has heard crazy rumors like blowing up a ship with the actors on it just for effect so getting sucked into a movie might not seem all that out of the ordinary. Although, I believe there should be a certain point in the map where our characters logically figure out the danger that they are actually in. Kind of like an inciting incident that puts the plot in motion. Like the Shadow Man reveal when you open a pack a bunch in Shadows of Evil, or the entirety of Groston House from World War II. It doesn't have to be something big, but even just a quote from the characters when they enter the projector room would go a long way. The stakes aren't all that serious to us, although I feel they should be serious to our characters, but that's just me. From our characters and story, let's talk more about the map itself. The best place to start out our review of the overall gameplay would be in its layout and aesthetic. Zombies in Spaceland's greatest strength is its creativity and sheer level of freedom offered to players. There's buildables, consumables, a main quest, multiple side quests, wonder weapon pistols, a ton of traps and arcade machines to mess around with, a ton of unique items for players to purchase, and so much more. The map is quite reminiscent of Jamie Zielinski's Transit, Die, Rise, and Buried, but for all of the right reasons. The gameplay of Spaceland feels like a properly fleshed out version of his ideas, and it's one of the map's greatest strengths. Speaking of great strengths, Zombies in Spaceland fully embraces the theme park location, with four primary space-themed locales for players to traverse through, which includes Journey into Space, the Arcade, the Kepler System, and Polar Peak. In addition to these areas, there's an underground utilidor reminiscent of Disney World that interconnects each of these zones, and a spawn area that acts as the map's central hub. Like Shadows of Evil before it, the map's elegance is tied to its tight level design that rewards quick thinking and promotes players to merge between areas seamlessly when combating the undead. For example, players trapped between Polar Peak and the Kepler system will find themselves at the water park. But by taking a simple right, players will be drawn to these slides that lead them straight back to spawn, giving players more options to corral and escape the horde. This seamless level design is what makes it easy for players to jump right into the action and feel accomplished for doing so. There's not a whole lot here for me to criticize because it's done really well. Much like Shadows before it, a great map knows how to flow each of its distinct zones into each other. This effect is usually achieved with teleporters and tight level design, with the latter just being talked about. But something I think Spaceland does better than some Treyarch maps is the inclusion of unusual and unorthodox pathways that connect faraway zones. Going back to our Shadows of Evil comparison, the ritual rooms scattered throughout the map are typically in the far back of each district, with very little connecting them together. Now granted, these two maps offer distinct level philosophies. The ritual rooms in Shadows of Evil offer players quest-specific functions, like opening a Pack-a-Punch and receiving the upgraded sword questline. Placing them at the back of each arena forces players to place themselves in dangerous situations mid-round, with these arenas, besides Narrows, only offering one way in and one way out. Spaceland doesn't force that kind of decision on players, 
and in a bid to make the maps flow seamless, the developers offer more than enough options for players to choose from, which I adore. One distinct pathway that primarily comes to mind is the layout between the arcades and the top of Polar Peak. It's a great way to connect the varying vertical levels of the map, while also connecting two extremely distinct level arenas. Although, the game's collision detection kind of flies in the face of this great level design. As discussed earlier, hitboxes are one of the game's bigger issues, and due to Spaceland's ambitious level design, it's easy for players to find themselves getting thrown all over the place. With the most egregious spot that this can happen is, is in Polar Peak. Specifically, the ramp and pathway leading up from the gift shop to the roller coaster. I actually really enjoy the way this arena is laid out, but it's once the game's AI is thrown into the fray, that's where things be can become a bit irritating. Then there's the map's art style. It's bright, colorful, and it feels like the development team went the full mile with the concept of a zombified theme park. One of my favorite things to do is to just walk around with the last zombie and explore all the little zones and details you can find, both in and out of bounds. Seriously, go give it a shot next time you're playing the map. I don't believe I can do it justice here. Next up, let's go into the map's ticket systems. As seen throughout the park, players will encounter various rewards that can only be redeemed using said tickets. These can be earned by completing challenges offered by the robot Neil, retrieving them from tote bags left behind by the undead, and are rewards to players for participating in and using various minigames throughout the park and the map's unique set of traps. Many of these arcade games can be found in, well, the arcade. Players have the opportunity to play skee ball, hit the targets, and everyone's favorite, basketball. Uh, so. These mini games are genuinely a lot of fun to play and actually master, despite the game's level of jankiness. Some of the rewards offered to players include quest specific items like the gold teeth, a unique wonder weapon titled the Forge Freeze, and ammo and grenade refills, which become imperative in the high rounds. It's honestly really cool the game rewards you for going out of your way to complete these mini games and kill the undead in unique ways. Sadly, in the higher rounds, it becomes next to impossible to properly play these mini games unless you're playing in co-op and then someone has to hold the zombie for you, which just kind of seems like poor co-op design. Another currency feature is the coin system. Periodically drop out of the undead, players are given three colored coins that can be entered into various machines around the map. Presenting the machine with any combination of coins grants players a random score streak like reward based off of the combination presented. Rewards include items as useless as an electric window trap, and ones as useful as a 25 second long monkey bomb. It is very exciting to experiment with different combinations, but once you know how to obtain a boombox, you probably won't turn back. Then there's Neil, a robotic ally who roams the map's hub and offers players various challenges and rewards. Completing five of these challenges shoots Neil into the sky. When he returns, he comes back with an upgraded paint job and David Hasselhoff. I love this feature. Getting to battle the undead alongside a celebrity figure is honestly a really cool idea, and because of the Hoff's charismatic attitude, he fits seamlessly into the world. Having him also provide players akin to the Silver Protector makes him an invaluable asset in the map's boss fight if you're playing co-op. The Hoff can also be found at various locations around the map where he'll be able to cycle through the map's large and rather impressive copyrightable song catalog. It can be said that the appearance by the Hoff isn't as timeless or universal as something like the Civil Protector from Shadows or Sergeant Adam from Alpha Omega. But in the context of the game's style and presentation, I'd say he fits better than if someone like Neil were to just bare arms and shoot a rocket launcher. Okay, actually wait, that sounds really cool. Honestly, there's just something about the Hoff's inclusion that just gives me this infectious smile. The ability to play as and have him fight alongside you seems like such a simple addition to the playing experience, yet it's effective at being memorable. For as many issues as I have with the game, there are just as many that remind me that this game was made with passion and love. But as always, that doesn't mean it's not exempt from criticism despite this. So, what enemies does Spaceland introduce? For the map's max ammo rounds, Spaceland pits players against the clowns, a low health popcorn style enemy that explodes. Players get too close to them. 
Okay, I have no idea as to why they do that, but sure. Like Hellhounds, clowns eventually become part of the standard enemy pool around round 15. Alongside the clowns are the Spaceland Brute, a behemoth of an enemy that stands at over 9 feet tall and brings death and destruction to the battlefield. The Brute, on the surface, acts like a Shadow's Margwa. It'll close the distance between it and the player, and then perform a slam attack once close enough, dealing near lethal damage. But aside from that similarity, the Brute is its own beast. Sporting a throwing projectile, moderate to high damage, a laser beam attack, and immunity to all damage, the Brute is an undead Ravenger that attempts to put players down. To defeat this enemy, players have to shoot at his helmet until he removes it. Any damage done in this time will not carry over into the Brute's actual health bar. Think of it more like armor that must be destroyed. When removed, the Brute will no longer fire long-range lasers at the player, and will instead quickly pick up the pace and attempt to slam players with a lethal ground pound. If the Brute is not finished off within a certain amount of time, it'll place the helmet back on its head, requiring players to do the same song and dance if they wish to defeat it. On one hand, I can consider the Brute an enemy that takes patience and strategy to defeat. On the other, I can call him a bullet sponge. Originally, I proposed that the helmet should only have to be knocked off a single time, and he shouldn't be able to put it back on. I still stand by that suggestion, but I've also found that if you actually use a bullet weapon, he'll fall apart quite easily so maybe he's not as bad as I originally stated him being. Regardless, the Brute is still an impressive threat on the battlefield, without being completely overpowering like any good special enemy should be. With the adversary said, let's see what the players can earn to combat these threats. Let's begin with the Wonder Weapons. Starting off in the arcade, players can purchase the Forge Freeze for 500 tickets. Able to stop the undead in their tracks, the Forge Freeze will, well, freeze zombies, and with the press of a left trigger, any undead still frozen will be killed by a concussive blast. This sounds effective in combat, a horde clearing freeze ray that kills anything in its path. Although in practice, the weapon leaves a lot to be desired, as its damage is rather low and it is quite inefficient at killing the undead for more than a round or two. And because the weapon uses a fusion mag, it is incapable of reloading naturally, and ammo must be fed into the clip from the reserves over time killing the weapon's player feel. The Forge Freeze is also hampered by the fact that it takes up one of the player's precious weapon slots. Likewise, it's highly advised not to waste your tickets on it. Then there's each area's respective wonder weapon. Kepler's Shredder, Journey's Face Melter, the Arcade's Discord, and Polar Peak's Head Cutter. When I originally wrote this section, I went in depth into each of the weapon's buildable processes. And let's be real, that's boring. So instead, let's go over the steps that stick out to me. All you need to build each pistol is an area-specific claw machine reward, a quest-specific battery, and an area-specific arcane core and crystal. Most of these steps are relatively simple and straightforward. For example, to unlock the headcutter's battery, players need to purchase cryo grenades from the arcade, throw the grenade into this statue in front of Polar Peak, and headshot 10 to 12 frozen zombies. You know, simple stuff like that! Fun fact, this battery is actually hinted at to players by the lone cryo grenades lying just beneath the statue. To obtain the face melter's battery, players have to throw a grenade into the journey into space fast travel portal while it's activated, causing a superpowered mega grenade to appear. Players must then play a game of hot potato and safely transfer it back to the teleporter in spawn, throwing it on the ground whenever it's about to activate, resetting the timer. Fun fact, this grenade can kill you even if you're holding bomb stoppers, and no, I totally didn't figure this out when I had no more quick revives left on a live stream, cause that would be crazy. What? On me? Skill issue? Hey. Hey, Raven Toffin. Pull back the clip on that. Did I have PhD, like, did I have bomb stoppers so that, like, you know, you know, do I have bomb stoppers so that, you know, like the, the whole point of that was to avoid that exact scenario happening. Let, let's just, let's roll back the footage, shall we? What's really cool is that this battery is also indicated to players through a grenade icon appearing behind the portal once it's been activated. After each of these parts is collected, players can build one of the four wonder weapons. The shredder tears zombies apart limb by limb. Firing into a small horde, the Shredder can stun enemies and rip apart 5-8 to eight zombies per shot. Great for in-the-moment crowd control. The Discord has the ability to cause one of the undead to start spinning on their head. 
turning their legs into a vortex of death. Any undead caught in this wacky animation will be quickly decimated. Easily the most efficient of the four, and arguably the best. The head cutter causes zombie, well heads, to explode in a rainbow of gore. Heads exploded will cause area of effect damage to other nearby enemies. And finally, there's the face melter. Causing zombies to turn into rockets and shoot into the sky, those who volunteer for the Apollo space program leave behind a nasty flame that can damage and kill undead who walk through it. This damage also applies to the players as well. Each of these wonder weapons are flashy, stylish, and excel in making the player appear powerful, but each of these pistols comes with many drawbacks. Each of their abilities can only be activated every few shots, limiting their killing potential, their ammo counts are quite low, and without the appropriate upgrades, you'll run through their ammo supply in just a round or two. And if you consider the fact that this game is infamous for having a stingy power-up cycle, it's quite rare you'll only be able to use any of the weapons long term. And honestly, they're just not worth all the work that goes into some of them. When playing the map, the pistols are best saved for the map's boss fight, as they apply effective single target damage to the boss. Outside of that, they're typically dead weight when compared to other strategies like Pack-a-Punch Kendall's or an M1 and the Mauler with the Wind Core, which is an ability that can be applied to any standard weapon, which you can earn while attempting to build Polar Peak's head cutter. The Wonder Weapons honestly function the best by using them as running gun items in standard play. In this kind of play style, players traverse the whole map mid-round and destroy any zombies in their path with high damage weapons. This playstyle is typically used on maps like Voyage of Despair with the Kraken, or any of the ExoZombies experiences with the S12. Sadly, doing this will yield the least efficient use of each of these Wonder Weapons ammo supply. But let's say you could upgrade those fancy Wonder Weapons, how do you do it? Well, all you have to do is Pack-a-Punch them with the double Pack-a-Punch fuses. Seems simple enough, right? Oh. Oh no. To upgrade the Wonder Weapons, players are required to complete the map's Easter Egg every single time they wish to unlock Double Pack-a-Punch, a pivotal step to upgrading the player's arsenal. So let's get into that Easter Egg, shall we? Zombies in Spaceland's Easter Egg is personally divisive. On one hand, the boss fight is comically stupid in co-op, and on the other, the SETICOM defense is comically stupid in solo without a proper setup. Let's talk about it. Zombies in Spaceland's main quest has players accomplish two tasks, build and charge up a device called the SETICOM, and encounter and defeat the aliens hiding within the UFO locked within Polar Peak. These two tasks requires players to be adept at two different skills, defense and offense, which is something I think helps separate the steps and makes them unique among everything in Zombies. Although, like always, dominant strategy does prevail heavily. While the game offers a ton of tools for players to use, Using the Pack-a-Punch Kendall's and an M1 with the Wind Core seems to get the job done the most efficiently. In solo, near perfection is required of the player on the third SETICOM defense, especially if you get a difficult location. In co-op, this stress is alleviated on the player, and the step becomes much easier with more teammates, allowing players to experiment with a ton of different options. And by options, I mean four Pack-a-Punch Kendall's, of course. This also gets into another issue with the SETICOM defenses. If players fail to defend the device, they will not be granted a max ammo for their troubles. And when you consider how many zombies the game throws at you during this step, a failed SETICOM defense could spell the difference between victory and failure. Because now without ammo, you're unable to defend yourself, try the defense in the next round, or proceed forward with the easter egg unless you get a max ammo drop. Honestly, it's just a mess and anyone who has failed the third defense knows what I'm talking about. But let's say you complete the third SETICOM defense, you're able to move on to the map's boss fight. After playing a short game, as Simon says, with the UFO, and surviving the clown rush, players are presented with the map's boss fight, the alien greys. Depending on the amount of players in the game, the boss fight will feature that many aliens. In solo, the fight is well balanced, as you can train around the map's whole hub until the cows come home. The fight almost has this fencing-style gameplay. The alien is able to teleport around and evade player attacks, but at the same time, constantly moving will make it harder for the alien to hit you, leaving combat pretty well balanced. While it takes a while, players are rewarded for their patience and focus, which is something not a ton of fights do, and it helps the boss actually feels like a threat. 
in co-op, it's a whole different story. The fight becomes extremely frustrating, and the problems become exponentially more difficult with more players. The aliens have numerous abilities, including but not limited to teleporting, stunning, summoning, shooting, and overall being pains in the neck. The weapons the aliens brand are actually the same Wonder Weapon pistols players can acquire, which I do think is really cool and adds to the whole fencing explanation. What's not cool is the fact that the shots fired have an area of effect that stuns players and does anywhere from 40 to 60% of their health if the shot manages to land a direct hit. And considering the fact that the aliens fire multiple shots at a time, it can lead to some very, very unfair deaths. This is also compounded with the fact that the difficulty of the match is greatly increased due to zombie spawns that aim to specifically appear under the player's feet, making it difficult to traverse the terrain. This effect is compounded again with IW's inconsistent enemy hitboxes, which drive me up a wall, because at times, it's just not fair. Like, wow, I totally could have predicted that that zombie that spawned beneath my feet was gonna be there. Because naturally in the hub, zombies have set spawns, with not many of them spawning in major areas beneath people's feet. But in the boss fight, all bars are off apparently. As previously mentioned, it feels unfair, which is the best way I can describe the game's level of difficulty, and it's going to be a common theme going forward. The boss fight becomes hectic in the worst way imaginable, and a downed teammate can quickly spell disaster. Because once you go down, you won't be able to claim any of your perks back, and because the game lacks defensive items like the shield or armor, a downed player might as well be dead weight. This might sound harsh, but the game's hyper-aggressive design makes it impossible to play even with Jug sometimes, much less without it. But I'm getting sidetracked, back to the aliens. And because the aliens teleport to a higher elevation, it does become difficult to coordinate with your teammates and kill them effectively. If you can beat this boss fight in four player without director's cut, hey, you can do what me and my team never could. Eventually, my friends and I discovered an exploit. If you fully bleed out in the boss fight, your corresponding alien will not move, frozen in place as if his will to live has been shattered. With this advantage, it becomes much more manageable to destroy the aliens one at a time, which is something I can praise the fight for. I don't believe the boss fight is awful, far from it, but it feels poorly designed for the co-op experience, which is strange because every other feature in this map is curated quite well. Defeating the aliens, in theory, is as easy as damaging them enough to slap a pack-a-punch fuse out of their backpack. A silly concept, but I just got a kick out of Point Dexter's wet-sounding slap dislodging this priceless item. Repeat this three times and the boss will be conquered. Taking the fuses into the pack-a-punch, players now have access to the double pack-a-punch feature for nearly every weapon on the map, and the upgrade to the Wonder Weapons. With this, the Wonder Weapon pistols now sport increased abilities, longer effect times, and an ammo supply that feeds ammunition from the stock into the clip, much like Nine's Death of Orion. While they still sport many of the same drawbacks, the increased ammo more than makes up for it. They're honestly not much better, but they're required to complete the main quest, so what can you do? Once all of that's complete, players can charge the archway with their pistols and destroy the UFO! Goofy, but a really cool effect. With the UFO defeated, players are granted access to a piece of the Soul Key, a fabled device that is foretold to help our crew escape this nightmare. And that's the map's main quest. What a mess. It's not that long, and when things get going, it's a lot of fun. But with little margin for error, it can feel much more unfair than it should be, especially for the game's launch map. The SETI comms don't allow solo players to properly experiment with the tools at their disposal, and the boss fight is unforgiving in co-op for all the wrong reasons, and with very little story, it can be difficult to get invested. Like, in the boss fight, there's almost no banter between the characters, or even any reaction to the map's boss appearing. They're all just kinda silent, which is a real shame. If there was anywhere to put in lines that would add to the map's more laid-back attitude, it would be in the boss fight. I can just imagine Point Dexter going, Gee willikers, a real alien! Well, not actually real, of course, but it looks so lifelike. I wonder what kind of textures Willard used. Look at how Nine uses its interactions between the characters to elevate the experience. Santa mierda! We're all going to die. How the hell are we supposed to bring that thing down? Every beast has its weakness. Ah. We simply need to find it. Ah, the gladiators control the behemoth from their perch. 
They fight from afar, the cowards. The armor, yes, it's the armor. It's fused with chaos. That must be how they control it. Now, granted, I'm not using Nine to say, oh, Spaceland pales in comparison to this Treyarch experience. Far from it. I'm simply using Nine as an example to provide context as to how that feature enhances the experience. Overall, I enjoy the main quest. When it's not unfair, that is. I'd highly recommend experienced players give it a shot. But be warned, it's way harder than it looks, but victory has never been sweeter. Alongside the main quest, Infinite Warfare features an additional side quest titled Ghost and Skulls. Ghost and Skulls is a side quest that requires players to complete extremely arbitrary challenges and puzzles for a chance to enter the titular machine and fight off against a horde of skulls using ghosts. These quests are sometimes longer than the map's actual main quest, but only offer players a permanent perkaholic, besides Quick Revive and Solo, for completing the entire thing. Until you end the game, of course. I've attempted some of these quest lines for the review, and let me preface it here. I hate Ghost and Skulls more than I hated the Easter eggs in IW in my original review. The steps are long, arbitrary, I don't even like the Ghost and Skulls minigame, and you can claim an actual permanent perkaholic just by activating Director's Cut, which is somehow easier than any of these Ghost and Skull side quests. And in Spaceland's case, the machine requires you to finish the map's main quest just to complete one of the steps. So at that point, is it even worth it? Regardless, let's talk about the minigame. You do a whole bunch of arbitrary garbage, yada yada yada, blow up some balloons, yada yada yada, play some arcade games, yada yada yada, complete the main quest. And once inside the machine, players are tasked with using a device called the Entangler to entrap ghosts flying about, and using them to destroy the skulls that appear. Hmm, fits the name. If three skulls make it across the board, it's game over, so destroying them as quick as possible is a must. The skulls can also fire back laser shots at the player, so paying attention is still required. But if you go down, you'll only lose a little bit of time. The skulls will come in three waves, and will appear in different formations with each wave. Slowly making their way towards the end of the screen, our characters take the role of the in-arcade characters to defeat the skulls. The whole concept is a tad meta, but in a fun way. Completing this version of Ghost and Skulls is quite easy, and once you've survived, or fail, you'll have completed the minigame and will be granted a permanent perkaholic until the game ends. And, as stated earlier, it doesn't serve much of a point because it requires you to complete the easter egg anyways, so it does feel a little redundant. Hopefully, things will improve with this side quest in the next map. Psst, spoiler alert, they only get worse. Now, let's finish out this review with all those little smaller things that I either didn't mention earlier or just forgot. Following the release of Black Ops 3, players were disgruntled with the fact that the game featured the same 9 perks it started with, with Widow's Wine being the only new addition players found. In a bid to promote new ideas, the community came together and came up with a perk called Banana Colada, a drink that would increase the player's slide distance, create a trail of bananas that would cause zombies to slip akin to the Swicklifier, and give players explosive resistance. The perk functioned like PhD Slider before the perk was officially invented. While only being rooted into a gobblegum during the release of Garage Crovy titled Slaughter Slide, Infinite Warfare Zombies saw the introduction of Trailblazers, a perk which incorporated the primary function of Banana Colada into its kit. As long as players slide on the ground, a trail of flames would be produced that damaged and even killed the undead at lower rounds. While not the most effective perk out there, its inclusion was a love letter to community support players had for this series, and its origins may one day be lost to the sands of time, it'll always remain as a sweet sentiment to the community. Alongside Trailblazers, Infinite Warfare reworked Mule Kick as Mule Munchies, the perk now costs 2,000 points, and it actually displays which gun was the player's third weapon. The fact it took a developer five years for that to happen is mind-boggling to me. And finally, there's the introduction of Slappy Taffy. Think of it as Ethereal Razor before the actual introduction of Ethereal Razor. Slappy Taffy simply grants players an increase to their melee abilities, but when you combine this perk with a system to remove a perk at will, it becomes an invaluable little asset in the early rounds and it allows players a variety of options to play, lets you melee in the early rounds, and also down because the enemy meleeing hitboxes are also really bad too. But it's nice the option's there. Then there's the bumper cars and the bumper car room, which can just down you if you aren't careful. And if you've never been down by those metal machines of death, 
then consider yourself lucky. There's David Hasselhoff's character code, which can be found in the music booth at any time, which I think is just the coolest. Then there's playing as the Hoff himself, which I adore. Even getting to hear him interact with himself is nothing short of gold. Then there are those Neil challenges, which remind me of the skill point trials from Extinction. The crocodile head in the Kepler system can kill any enemy, including the alien himself, if you hack the game to glitch him out of the arena. And how could I forget about the Spaceland roller coaster? At the top of Polar Peak is Triton, an on the rail shooter that takes players through the titular Polar Peak. While the ride itself is nothing special, it's the technical aspect that blows my mind. The ride itself is decently lengthy too, and just the way that they're able to wrap each of the track's layers through the mountain and through the arena itself is nothing short of fantastic. If there was anything I missed out on reviewing in my original video, it was this coaster. Even if you don't earn the most tickets for the amount of time you spend on it, I can't recommend enough giving it a go if you haven't already, even if it's just for a casual viewing. Then there's also those doors in Spawn, the three doors that lead to the Kepler system, Polar Peak, and Journey into Space. The doors cost initially a thousand points in solo, but with each player, the price increases by a thousand points, going to 2,000, 3,000, and even 4,000 in four player. Before the game came out, Lee Ross and the development team hinted at the idea of donatable doors, that players can work together to pay for the more expensive doors in the map. Awesome, and you've also got the door sharing mechanic in this game, so you can buy doors together, right? Yeah, that's actually a great point. So that's new to uh, Zombies in Spaceland. So yes. uh, let's say the two of us are playing, uh, usually I would hold out and say, you're gonna have to buy that door because right. I want to buy something else myself. Yep. But this time we can actually put a little of your cash, a little of mine, and we can buy those doors together. So the burden is not just pressed on you or on me. Uh, and it helps it helps our, our cash, you know, spread the wealth a little bit between us. Sounds good. As it turns out, those doors only appear in Zombies in Spaceland. And it's also an arbitrary donation feature because the doors increase anyways with the amount of players in it. So you just can't, like... It's not like a teamwork thing. You've just made it artificially harder to enter these areas in co-op because you made the doors more expensive. Like, that's not really cool. You've just made it more expensive for players to have, like, to, as the illusion of, oh, work together to buy the doors. Sorry, this is unscripted now. No, I'm just angry about it now. I completely forgot to include it in the review. I think what Past Me is trying to say here is that the idea is actually really cool. It's never been done before, and it would absolutely encourage teamwork between players. Although, it's very likely that the idea was never fully developed, Lee Ross misinterpreted Miles' question, or they were unable to fully complete the mechanic the way it was intended, and is now an artifact of what it used to be. It also doesn't help this feature doesn't show up on any other IW map either after Spaceland, further driving home the idea that it was left on the cutting room floor. And finally, there's the arcane cores, which I've only brought up briefly. These upgrades are similar to the alternate ammo types found in Black Ops 3, 4, and Cold War. These funky little abilities must be unlocked by completing a side quest, and they can be attached to one gun at a time. Most of them suck, except for the aforementioned Wind Core, which can be collected at Polar Peak. I sing this thing's praises because it activates often, kills enemies in a close proximity to the blast like it's Thunderwall, is completely overpowered, and deals massive damage to the Brute. Seriously, I cannot recommend it enough just putting this ability on weapons like the M1 which you find in the spawn room. You think the game already has a dominant strategy with the Pack-a-Punch Kendalls? Try using this behemoth. You'll never go back. Honestly, I'm probably missing a few more things too, but this map review is already long enough. But that's the beauty of Zombies in Spaceland. There's a reason this one is heralded as one of the best of the best. And after going back through it, I couldn't agree more. The map mostly suffers from issues with the IW engine and direction which includes dodgy hitboxes and unfair enemy balancing in the boss fight. Sadly, these points will be referenced again and again as we continue our review, as they are a universal constant, rather than an issue only plaguing one map. While the characters we play as leave a lot to be desired, it's hard not to admire the sheer dedication and the commitment to the tone, stylization, and overall theming. The gameplay is some of the most creative we've seen in quite some time, and it's very reminiscent of Jimmy Zielinski's style of development during Black Ops 2, especially in maps like Buried, which was a massive sandbox of options and decision making. Zombies in Spaceland carries this torch into the modern day, while still bringing with it a slightly more conventional main quest, with a Ghost and Skull side quest that makes me feel like I'm back on Die Rise and Shangri-La. The special enemy choices, while cookie cutter, play things safe but manage to not completely ruin the experience. 
and the wonder weapons make players feel accomplished for building them, but not all assembly is created equal, and the effort you put into making some of them usually isn't worth it. The easter egg is all over the place, but shines through when at its best. And overall, Zombies in Spaceland is a well-made, jam-packed experience with just about anything for every type of player. But with all that said, join me next time as we continue our quest to re-review this game with Rave in the Redwoods. Cut! 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 Ah, you're ruining this film! Why won't you just die at you already? Thank you all for watching. This is only part one of my Infinite Warfare Zombies re-review. So subscribe so you can stay up to date as to when I release part two. If you like this video, then I can't recommend enough my other reviews of AW, World War II, Cold War, and Black Ops 4's 9. And if you're looking for something different, how about my historical roundup of all of the current cut content found in the series? But with all that said, thank you for watching. And remember, keep on slaying.